Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Seriously, maybe some of you will be filled with some revival spirit when we're done with this. Because um, what we talked about, what me and Majori talked about this, is that, um, uh, you know, frankly, I think you know that the Occupy movement is kind of in a transition phase right now after the real success is in last autumn. And so I, uh, what we're talking about, what I want to talk about today was officially it was supposed to be transportation sustainable and sustainability, which is, of course, the main topic that you were brought here. But we also wanted to bring out what I call overcoming Wall Street, to particularly to explain, thank you, thank you, because to especially explain that sustainability, environmentalism, you know, it's really good. I recycle my bottles and cans. Don't bother me, right? I got a Prius. All right? I'm doing more of my part. Finding, no, that, that's not me, but actually, I don't know how a car. But that that's not going to really undermine or to liberate we as the producers in this society. And that's what I want to talk about. And uh, using some ideas. Um, of course, uh, since I've got a nice here flip chart, uh, you can feel free to interrupt, ask questions or like. We just need to move along. But if you have any questions, feel free and uh, uh, to, ch to chime in. The program today will be uh, to talk, give you some ideas about consumerism as a theory, as a political theory. To talk about some of the progress pr principles of progressivism. I identify as a pragmatic progressive. But then we're going to talk about some of the areas of transportation and stable community design. And finally, I want to talk about Honolulu. And give you some ideas about why rapid transit is so important uh, for Honolulu's future. First, let's have a show of hands. How many of you have heard of ad busters? About half. Right. Those of you who aren't, probably don't realize that Occupy Wall Street was actually a product, a pro project of ad busters. Um, it actually came from an idea and it just completely took off, off out of their expectations. Ad busters is an organization that's headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I encourage you to check out their website if you've got internet access. I think it's adbusters.com. Uh, another project that you may have heard that wasn't nearly successful is called Buy Nothing Day. Yeah. Right, okay, and uh, that's just some of the things. They also have another one called Black Spot, where they deliberately, you can actually buy a pair of tennis shoes that deliberately have no brand. Their brand is having no brand. Now the question is, I will be too late, whether or not that's, if that got trendy, would that kind of subvert the whole principle? Anyways, Adbusters calls itself an anti-advertising agency, and that's why they're specially is making parody ads. Uh, also, uh, they also produce a really great magazine. If you've seen the Average Bed Busters magazine, uh, I can, I'll give a free plug to the coffee table over on University Avenue. They stock the Ad Busters magazine. So they don't have to sell it, but you can always go there and read the latest copy. Um, so they make funny ads. They make ads that are like, I can't believe this is being advertised. That's the point but it's to make you realize it is being advertised. And I'm going to talk about the significance of advertising. Um, the brilliant quality of, 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 ad, of ad busters, as I say, uh, really belies the theory behind the group. They have a theory, not just a, a product, if you will, a funny product, called anti-consumerism. Let me talk about what consumerism is. Here's where the hard theory gets. So here's like warning science content. <laughs> um, I don't know if you ever heard the phrase spectacular society, but I'm going to introduce, explain that to you. Karl Marx. Most of you have heard of him. German, dead, had a beard. Uh, by the way, it shows one thing. Whatever you do, don't get uh, addicted to alcohol. That's probably what killed him off first. But Karl Marx uh, is actually, he's a philosopher, uh, but he was actually, in a, he actually specializes most of his life in the field of economics. He really deserves to be considered an econ economist. In fact, 
he deserves to be considered a follower or a, um, a follow-on to Adam Smith, which is really funny because Adam Smith, you're always told, is like, oh, he's like the patron saint of capitalism. He isn't. Um, Marx is actually based on, he actually went directly from, from, uh, from, from him, from Smith. Um, Marx, first issue of Marx I talked about was called Before Capitalism Says Marx, there was use value. I'll wait for this to pass by. We're uh, half a block from the Straub Hospital, so we're going to be getting this, and we'll take the opportunity to hand through the uh, early crowd here. We're expecting more people, of course. value is the idea that um, the price of something is based on the amount of labor that goes into it, while exchange value is the price that you actually see on the, on the store. Um, I'll explain that a little better. And the idea that if labor determines what use value is, then, uh, these, are, then these are related. Anyways, maybe I'm going to step over here. You can see the trouble is this when these two got stuck taped in. Okay. Um, class identity was another idea. Marx was this idea that if you're going to create social change, people need to understand how they're actually being exploited, why, who's responsible, and also ultimately, therefore, you know what to change once you know what's causing your grief. Um, one thing that Marx emphasized was that capitalism and worker exploitation is inevitable, which I'll also explain. In other words, in a way, even the capitalist is a prisoner of, the, of an unjust economic system. And finally, uh, that once exchange value dominates our ideas of what something is worth, then it means that ultimately our, our, our interpersonal relationships are dominated by economic values. Um, in other words, and I'll talk about it, like, uh, you start literally identifying or you're being identified by what you own, right? Uh, if I tell you where somebody lives, what neighborhood they live in, you have an idea what kind of income level they're at, right? What kind of car they drive. Yes, Abraham Lincoln actually wrote, Labor Creates All Wealth. Now, um, but of course, he didn't, get, he didn't invent that idea. He just wrote it and he agreed <laughs> with it. No, he agreed with it. Seriously, we, we found this in his own personal notes. Use value is determined by labor plus capital depletion. The example I'm giving here is, um, you know, if, if I got to make something and I got to make a, so use a saw, and the saw, let's say it's a diamond cut, you know, a diamond tip saw, and I can only cut like a thousand times with it before I have to get a new one. Well, then obviously I need to get a little more than just the labor value, or I'm not going to make anything more than, a, I'm not going to make a thousand and one of it, right? I'm going to make a thousand and I'm going to have a dead tool. So, but by the way, that also means that what is land then? You're probably thinking, wait a minute, Hannah, what about land? Land does not have a labor value. And if you don't believe me, if you could find a piece of land on this earth that had nobody living on it, and there was no government that said you couldn't have it, it'd be yours for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, ironically, that's kind of what happened when the Native American people were killed by all the disease. Um, exchange value is the price paid by buyers. And this is the key. Surplus is the exchange value minus the use value. Uh, don't forget, labor is the cost, real, it says Marx, labor is the cost of what it takes to reproduce the labor, meaning the cost of paying, you know, not just, not only do you have to feed people so they don't starve to death, but you also have to provide them housing and clothing. 
But then there's the expense of providing for their children, because we're talking about a continuous system that goes on for generations. But it also tells you that, as you know, uh, the slower and lower you get, uh, the lower and lower the cost of labor. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'll give you an example, though. A lot of people have heard that. How many of you have heard of the Irish potato famine? Yeah, thank you. Wave in the hand. Thanks a lot. This is the interesting thing with the Irish potato famine, I think. The reason why it happened was because the potato was introduced into Ireland. The potato was the first food that people could live on without meat. So the, by providing the potato to the Irish, the English landowners were able to exploit those poor workers even further by denying them any meat. So when the potato crop failed, they had no meat, they had no grain, they had, literally they were eating some nettles and then they starved to death. And if you didn't know, an estimated 5 million people starved to death in the Irish potato family. Um, it's also the reason why Liverpool has, is one quarter Irish. Um, and we gained nearly 1 million people. So, that should tell you what labor value is. And the exchange value is the price that's paid by an actual buyer. So the surplus, which means profit per unit, is the exchange value minus the use value. Now look at that. Think about this. If you're the capitalist, this is the capitalist profit, right? So the only way you're going to make more money is by increasing the exchange value or lowering the use value. And how would you do that? Well, I've made a lot of lists. You could, for instance, get together with all your fellow competitors and stop competing and fix the prices. You could uh, fraud. You could always uh, tell the consumers they're getting something they're not getting and pocket the difference. You can use patents, copyrights, and monopolies to, again, raise the exchange value. You could use efficient machinery, which is a way to lower the use value without necessarily exploiting workers. You could use labor-saving machinery, which is a way to use fewer workers and thus cut down use value. You could also cut their wages and their benefits so that the labor itself costs less. You could break their but you can break their union so they can't combine against you and thus raise wa wages. You can press for tax cuts and reduce regulation, which lowers your costs. You can increase the amount of pollution you put out. And thus, you put your costs on the on, on the burden some on your next door neighbor. You can use child labor. You can ex use exploited women labor. You can use forced labor. Yes, among many other possibilities. But as I said, remember that if your competitor uses these methods. It's very hard for you, the nice capitalist who's trying to be fair to everybody, to stay in business without exploiting people as well. Let's talk about unemployment. If labor input is what creates or implies and increases the surplus, if that's related to surplus, that means when the surplus goes up, the labor input goes down. I mean, saying, if you want to increase the surplus, you need to lower the amount of... One way to do it is to lower the amount of labor. And, of course, if you lower the amount of labor, you'll increase your surplus. We call that downsizing. Um, also, however, now, if your surplus is shared with your workers, then everyone should benefit. Because production will go up because those workers will have money to buy stuff that other workers make and unemployment will fall. But if the surplus is monopolized by capitalists, and the correct Marxist term for this is expropriate the surplus, meaning the capitalists take the whole surplus, then production goes down, unemployment goes up, and that's regardless of the actual need for the products. Any questions on that one? Now let's talk about, that's so far, that's Marx, basic Marxist theory, going up through. If you actually read volume one of Capital, that's what you would get. Society is a spectacle. 
I really like Guy Debord. He passed away in 1991, another example of what happens when Frenchmen drink too much wine. <laughs> However, he was an art critic. And because he was an art critic with a real interest in Marxism, he created a theory of the economics based on mass media that focused on the effect of mass media in our modern economic system. So he said, this is a rough paraphrase of his phrases, in a modern capitalist society, life is dominated by images, I would say, of things being used by people. Right? I mean, if I want to sell, say, blended, you know, Canadian club whiskey, blended, blended whiskey, right? I'm not just going to show you a picture of a bottle. I'm going to show you some apparently uh, successful people drinking it, right? See what I'm saying? You think about it now. Every, most images of products that you actually see, if it's a car or a pair of shoes or a bottle of whiskey or cigarettes or, you know, anything, legal services, it shows people. And the idea being that these images are so important, they actually are the way we relate with each other. All you have to know, I'm sure every one of us probably has a friend who thinks that Apple products are incredible and thinks nothing of spending the over, you know, two nights sitting out in front of the store or whatever just to get his latest Apple product. And as I said, what the board pointed out was that these things being used by people convince us that owning a thing, whatever it may be, will transform our lives. It'll make us happier, you know, more popular, maybe more sexy, maybe, maybe people will think more, more, more intelligent, um, you know, whatever. However, because things can only be made profitably in large numbers, we are talking about a modern capitalist society with mass production. Those things become undesirable as soon as they're sold. We all know the person who's like, yeah, can you buy, I'm gonna buy my iPhone 3 from me? I want to get the iPhone 4. That leads to both waste and pollution as well as excessive energy use. Because, of course, making the thing, whatever it is, from a car to an iPhone, uses energy, produces pollution. Even, I didn't get the numbers, I was kind of curious how much pollution is being produced by just solar cell panels. But I'm sure you'd be surprised. Even a totally green thing, like a solar cell panel, I mean, for God's sakes, it's got gallium arsenide in it, is going to produce pollution. Which obviously is part of the you know the part of the effect of making it. So it means making it make it last a long time. Or a wind generator. A wind generator. You might think, well, that doesn't produce any pollution, right, Hannah? Yeah, except for the lubrication that goes whipping around inside. You actually see these machines? You'll see they use a lot of grease. All right, that's not. Or and of course, there's energy and pollution producing the the thing itself. That also, that overconsumption that leads to excessive work, social alienation, which of course is that feeling of, you know, don't worry about, you know, I'm not going to worry about you, I got all I care about me, or I got more troubles, or, you know, you're, 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 up, you're on your own. And of course, popular support for, I put in other words, capital suppression, imperialism, militarism, and war. Otherwise known as, why do people watch Fox News and vote Republican? <laughs> because they're trapped in this cycle. And of course, that's okay, because even though the thing is no longer undesirable, as you know, there's those images tell you to buy more stuff, work harder, be more focused on earning money, cutting your tax, you know, voting for politicians who promise to cut your taxes, that kind of stuff, right? So that you can go out and buy more stuff. Oh, and by the way, then of course women create the next generation of workers. I'm a gender scholar, I have to remember, forget women are in this picture too. All right, ways to escape, just some ideas. One, of course, is do it yourself. And uh, another is, um, oh, thanks, 
is um, just some ideas. Life hacking. Check if you don't know what life hacking is, go check the web. Uh, there's a really cool site, and you'll be like, you like read this, and I'm sure you'll be like, shoot, I didn't know you could do that with this. Um, freeganism. That's uh, that's if you haven't heard that freegan, that's the idea of, of uh, just finding stuff and uh, using it for free. Or you could also call it, we used to call it reuse. Um, there are just different ways to organize, to organize a, what may seem like a business without, a, uh, without having to use, without profit, whether that's a nonprofit organization or cooperatives, or I mentioned government. Now remember, what is a nonprofit organization? What is government really, is it? But a nonprofit organization that doesn't, that you, that is, that's mandatory. You have to belong to it. You have to pay for it, if you will. Right? I mean, a uh, brief example of that is, uh, none of us remember this, but up until the early 20th century, at least the late 19th century, it was really common to have no city fire department. How? So if you wanted fire protection, you would have to pay for it in advance, you know, once a year, like everything else. If you didn't, your house would just burn, your stuff would just burn down. What are the problems with that? You might, of course, is that first thing, and also, of course, there was free entry. So guess what happens? Certain neighborhoods have more than one fire department trying to protect them, competing against each other. Other places have got no fire protection. Hence the volunteer fire departments that we're all familiar with. That's where they originate from. And, um, and by the way, and, and of course, the thing is, of course, is that uh, there are, believe it or not, there are actually documented instances in which fire company members actually fought with each other physically because they would get a bonus if they put the fire out. So they would, they'd have to fight over the right to fight, to fight the fire. Well, the fire's going on. Um, and another problem, of course, was sheer cost. You probably know this if you think about our healthcare system, which kind of works the same way now, is that the, um, the cost of advertising, the cost of management is so much higher than the cost of having what we have now, which is just, there's a fire department everywhere. It's, I'm sorry about that, the cable's breaking. It's uh, spaced around evenly, right, all over the place. There's, you know, it's uh, because you actually pay more for your fire protection than you do now under our city mandatory system. But as you well know, uh, nobody else can enter the business of firefighting. Let's also point out that while we're talking about do-it-yourself and life hacking, and there's also something called recuperation, which is the fact that you know, the, one of the great ironies in the world is there's, there are people who are, you know, paid uh, next to nothing to make t-shirts that have Che Guevara, the famous Central American revolutionary's picture on them. Or another example, though, would be gangster rap. I mean, in my time, gangster rap was a real legitimate expression by real genuine artists, in my opinion, like 1984, 85. But today... It's nothing more than a, than a also it, it really criticized society in 1984-85. You know, like, sometimes they say, wonder how I keep from going under. Remember? <laughs> yeah. Grandmaster Flash? Grandmaster Flash. And today, what is gangster rap about? It's about antisocial behavior. It encourages social alienation. It has, it never criticizes capitalism. Right? And, uh, and I'm not to take away someone's right to free speech, but the facts are that it's not, it, it, is, it is an example of recuperation. Long ago, long ago, gangster rap, rap was, re, was well, actually just rap. If you go back to, you know, Rapper's Delight and stuff like that, rap was, was, was uh, recuperated by mass media. Briefly, now we're on the second page, second period. Principles of progressivism. If you've never asked yourself, what is progressivism? And I can tell you, you know, lots of times, people use it all the time, they never explain it. 
But if you actually see what it is, as far as I'm, I'm going to make the argument that it's about social progress, which means progressivism is not necessarily left-wing or right-wing, because it's not really focused on those sort of things. It's focused on moving society forward and keeping it from falling backwards. And therefore, it's not liberalism. It's, I always say it's not. I have an article, by the way. Oh, thank you. Sure. Well, can you, um, can you repeat the question? Sure. The question was, what do you mean by forward? Which I was hoping to slip by that. <laughs> Good job. If you want to know, I would suggest go read the speeches of Martin Luther King. Because he uses the phrase progress. Phrases like, social progress will not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. And if you read him further, then you know what he's talking about. Social justice, people being able to take care of their children and their wives and their families, getting education, um, of course, being free of discrimination, a democratic government that's responsive to them, not having wars all the time, these sort of things. So what I'm saying is progressivism is not liberals who don't want to be called liberals. It's not socialists who don't want to be called socialists. It's not libertarianism. It's not just left of liberalism. And it's not anarchism. I wrote an article, by the way, it's called uh, Defining a Second Progressive Movement. And I uh, welcome to read it. It's online. It's, it's at www.nationalprogressive.org. And my website is nationalprogressivereview.org, which you can remember as the new NPR. Um, and this was the 12-point summary of what I thought progressivism is. First, it is that if you... Yeah, you, you, you Number one, if you've got a social problem, you have to solve it socially. A great example, and I'm going to give a shout out to C. Wright Mills, if you ever heard of him. C. Wright Mills, Sociological Imagination. He said, consider unemployment. If you live in a city of a million people, and you're the only one who doesn't have work and looking for it, then you're probably lazy and you need to work harder finding a job. But if a third of the people in your town are out of work, there's really no point in kicking yourself for not finding a job because there are these hundreds of thousands of other people with no work, right? And that's not an exaggeration. I lived in a county like that. So 13% unemployment. Uh, so that... We have to work together if we're going to solve social problems, any social problem, from firefighting to overcoming Wall Street. Number two, you have to keep theory in perspective. I believe this is the biggest problem with so-called conservatism today, is that they have these theories which they treat as the truth without ever considering it. I'll give you a quick example of that. They'll say, for instance, that they think that it's good to have choice. So, for them, instance, the reason why they don't want to have single-payer health care, or for that matter, Obamacare, is because it will destroy choice in health care. Think of this. I was stunned by the statistic. Before the 2007 crash, there were over 400 types and brands of toothpaste being made in the United States. Today, there are less than 300 because of the market falling. Was your life enriched by having 400 kinds of toothpaste to buy? I mean, do you know what it's like to stand in front of a... I can tell you what it's like. You stand in front and you're like, you're like toothpaste from here over to there. And you're thinking, which brand do I want? What flavor do I want? Do I want gel? Do I want multi-gel? Do I want the paste? Do I... You're right? 
what size am I going to buy? Am I going to buy two? Oh, that one comes with a, with a free toothbrush. And, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And you sit there and you stare at the, and you, and you spend so much time wasted look, deciding what brand of toothpaste to buy. At least that's me. Or another one, of course, is, yeah, I got a choice about where to fly. You ever try to fly in a mix, mix or, uh, think about you tried, next, last time you tried to make a trip on an airplane? And you sit there, if it's a reasonably complicated trip, right? And you sit there thinking, which, which like here, right? Do I fly through Seattle? Do I fly through LA? Do I fly through right? And which which airline which which airline to take and which airport to go through and and how long do I stay and right? I mean, when I was a kid, I remember when we had things called travel agents. You called them up, you told them where you were going to go, you told them how long you were right, you told them when you want to go and when you want to get back. And two hours later, they had the whole thing worked out. You didn't have a lot of choice, but you wasted you saved a lot of time. Okay, number three, seek the greatest good for the most people. This is classic Benthamism. If you don't know what that is, greatest good for the greatest number. Number four, thank you. Conserving for a better future, which I like because that means education is an example of using our resources today to educate our children so that they'll be more productive in the future. But so is environmental protection, right? We don't cut down all the trees, so we're going to have more. Tree, we'll have some trees to cut down in the future. We don't use, we don't eat all the fish today, so we can eat some more fish later. So we can serve to have a better future. Number five, basing policy decisions on science. We don't just mean, of course, uh, you know, like some of our Republican uh, legislators actually or candidates actually say uh, that they don't believe in evolution. That's one example of this. But in general, as you'll see, I'm going to talk about numbers and science, and you may have some doubts, but when you don't answer me with some science of your own, it's very difficult to have, an, have any kind of discussion or have any kind of enlightenment. So we call for making decisions based on science. We don't know all the answers, but we're going to make less mistakes if we start with science. Number six, government is not inherently evil. Evil government is an evil? Is an evil? Inefficient government is an evil? But the answer is not to destroy the government. The answer is to fix the government. Number five, seven. That's number seven there. Experiencing efficiency determine government size. Yes, question. Uh, can you between the government and the state? Uh, there is none. Seriously, seriously. Yeah. State and government are, are, would be the same. Number eight, no abuse of corporations or individuals. Uh, meaning, it's not that all corporations are bad, but that if they're not regulated well, we just discussed earlier, right, they're going to get bad. Because someone, if someone's going to run a corporation badly. Same thing for individuals. Um, nine, Participatory democracy. Let's have a show of hands. I know a lot of the graybeards have heard of, of uh, participatory democracy, right? Yeah. Pavel, right? Participatory democracy is, is an idea from the early 60s and 60s. It's not just voting. It's saying that big decisions should be made. If they affect a lot of people, they should not be made by, you know, 10 people highly paid board members in a corporate board office, you know, in a, behind closed doors, like, you know, but they should be made by everybody in a perspective, particularly like workers. So that's a radical concept. Number 10, public decisions should be made democratically. 10 should not be even on there, except that we've got voter fraud, voter ID laws, election fraud going on, things like that. So yeah, let's remember that government that does not it is not voted on by everybody, isn't in fact a legitimate government. Number 11, property rights are social construction. That completely flies in the face of libertarianism. But I can tell you as a lawyer, there is, God did not make property law. <laughs> All right? Property rights exist. Because that's an efficient way to divide up things like land and personal property. We agree to them. 
but I believe we can change them at will and within the limits of the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which is uh, uh, no taking without, uh, no taking except for public purpose with, ju with just compensation. Yes? Um, so, for five, you have uh, policy based on science. Yep. What about uh, the role history plays in the course of, say, a society or human evolution? The, well, the question is, what is uh, the role of history plays, and, and and that's really great because, frankly, that's what I meant by number two. This is why I'm, I always talk history. If you already know me, I'm, I'll bore you with history. Because to me, history is like a lab book. It's like it tells us what worked in the past and what didn't work in the past and why it didn't work. Which is also why we need to have well-funded and we need to keep uh, politicians out of history research. Finally, number 12, freedom is the right to live under equal rules. In other words, freedom is not what you might have thought beforehand, which is I got the right to do whatever I want. But in fact, that everybody follows the same rules, which of course we have decided democratically. This, by the way, is the idea of John Locke. And if you ever heard of him, 1690, two treasons of civil government, our, our democracy, yes, was some governments are not fixable and that's true but those governments are not democratic I mean I think I think that was what that would be my answer to is that somewhere in there is some unjust privilege some unrepresentativeness something like that uh, you know I've been thinking about you know the Roman Empire you know didn't actually fall in the sense of you might be thinking well it fell because all those barbarians came and they burned everything and this that's not what really happened. What really happened was people in places like England and France and, 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 uh, and Spain and whatever, what is now those countries, decided that they didn't want to keep paying taxes to support a big government in, in, in Rome because it wasn't meeting their needs. And that's what happened to Europe. And in fact, if you went to Italy, there really isn't a line between. You can't really tell where the Roman Empire ends and modern Italy begins because that's just what sort of happened, you know, that the central, right, Rome, the Roman Empire fell, but Italy continued. So, uh, just briefly a re recount of what I talked about. But what we're talking about here is don't discount, ignore experience. I said that's history. Invest and conserve for a better future and base policies and decisions on science. Now we're going to get to what we were here to talk about, which is, I hope you, have, you got some value there, because what I was talking about here was, uh, I don't think it's been discussed much, and, you know, especially not, you know, actually anywhere. Uh, I don't know what they've been talking about Occupy, over at Wall Street. Five minutes. Okay, we're going to move on. Well, nevertheless, so I want to briefly talk about what auto-oriented design is. In other words, what kind of communities you want to live in, in the future. And also give you, give you some numbers on land, energy, and materials used compared. And then compare bus and rail. Although I don't think I have any slides in that. Why is it that I'm so against cars? Give me two examples. Remember I told you I'm a transportation engineer? Transportation engineer. This is a parking stall. Okay? A parking stall has to be 10 to 12 feet wide. Because people are about 3 feet wide. The car is six and a half feet wide, and it's 20 feet long, because that's how long we have, we have, to, we have to accommodate different types of cars, and you need about 10 extra feet here, and then of course you need 10 more feet here, so you can turn the car out. That's the most efficient way to park a car. And that is space for one car, or up to six motorcycles, 
That means you can back them in and out without moving all the others out of the way. Nine bicycles, if you include this space over here. Or 35 people if they're standing with luggage, baggage, you know, that sort of thing. That's a very conservative low number there, 35 people. Wheelchair accessible. Well, I don't have to cover time for covering everything, but maybe we can have a discussion. Uh, no. Oh, oh, accessibility around the on the cars and stuff. Well, of course, um, that was just a regular parking stall. Is that right? What what yeah, what do you think he has? Yeah, right. Of course, you need more space if it's a handicapped spot. So in one acre of land, this consists of 43,560 square feet. You can put 145 cars. You can park 145 cars on that. You can park 871 motorcycles, 1,305 bicycles, or you can put 5,000 people in there. That's 200. Okay. Or another way of looking at that is, if I've got a building which attracts 5,000 people and they came at 1.2 persons per car, I'm going to need, they're going to come in over 4,000 cars and I'm going to need 29 acres of parking. Which gives you an idea why suburbia looks the way it does. Because this is auto-oriented design. One, sorry. Oh, one other thing. This is street traffic. If you didn't know, the most efficient way to run vehicles is 30 miles an hour. If they're slower, you don't get the, you don't get the volume. And on a freeway, these numbers get much even worse than this. So you need a 12-foot lane, 20 feet. You need 88 feet between cars, two seconds. You have one car. You can put four motorcycles in that space, 14 bicycles if they're going 10 miles an hour, or 72 pedestrians. This is auto to design. The number one element, you know, think about the word drive-through, right? The number one element of an auto to design is it has fast assets of roads and highways. It's a building that's set out there, surrounded by parking. You can, ideally, you can drive into it and you can get out of there as fast as possible. And you can get on your way to the next building with a lot of parking around it. It means the most parking possible is near the building entrance. It means the transit cycle and pedestrian access is ignored or it's an afterthought. We all know that, right? The building has a bus stop half a block away, out there somewhere. And to get into this building, you have to like dodge cars coming in and out. You know what it's like to get in 4.30. Okay. Don't forget cul-de-sacs and fences that block access. And finally, public space gets privatized. Transit-oriented design is where you have transit, cycle, and pedestrian access prioritized over autos. Your conflicts with autos are minimized. Walking and cycling distances are minimized. That means the buildings themselves look different. They uh, have lots of, uh, they're, they're designed for walking. Okay. And public spaces encourage interaction. Another thing I talk about, I mean, I'm going to skip the last section on this. Living streets. Uh, how many of you heard of the Complete Streets Ordinance? A little bit of that? And, um, well, they can go further, and that's living streets, where you can actually encourage the street to be used for other than transportation. Obviously, it's narrow, slow streets, but it started in the Netherlands. It's been used in the United States as well. They use the space for everything. They literally post signs that tell children play here. They post, they put bike, bicycle racks, they put benches, trash cans, right in the side, right on the side of the road. So you can't, it encourages you not to drive fast. And then there's cycle tracks which are special roads or full road lanes. Some of you who have been on the, lived on the mainland have seen some really innovative designs where uh, cycles are deliberately encouraged, they're giving priority over auto traffic. Uh, all these things, of course, slow down auto traffic, which makes the road safer for everybody else. And that, of course, is the ultimate problem with the ultimate goal of complete streets, is uh, to make 
make the road safer for everybody, not just people driving. Uh, sorry, I think we want to throw this in. These are some numbers I'm going to give out to you. 28% of the U.S. energy consumption is for transportation. 82% of that is used by cars and trucks. The remaining 0.7 is used by buses. Now, this is from the uh, Department of Energy. I don't can't quite believe that 1.55 persons is the average car occupancy. I don't believe that. But if it is, it's 3,538 BTUs per passenger mile. Light trucks are a little bit higher than that, but also uh, they hire more people. Buses, the average bus apparently carries 9.2 people at any one time. I know our buses are way over that, I think. That's why the, the BTU is so high per passenger mile. As I point out, if you could get 40 people on it, that's just filling up all the seats. That goes all the way down to 976. And rail transit, the average train is carrying 24 and a half people per car. And that's 2,516. Or, as I said, you have 60 people, so you can see how that works. You can see how important it is basically to load up your vehicle. Because just driving empty around is, is not saving energy at all. Another thing, pollution. A lot of people think pollution, oh, I forgot to mention noise. Oh, I put, didn't put noise on here. Noise. Pollution is from cars is a lot of sources. Carbon monoxide, volatile organics, evaporated fuel and spilled fuel, nitrous and oxides, carbon dioxide, particularly from tires is a big factor. You get lubricants and road erosion, which pollutes water. And uh, also, of course, the energy from just making the car itself, making the tires, making all the disposable products uses up a lot of energy. Okay, that's it. So those are giving numbers. Sorry, I don't have the time to talk about. You know, all right. Sorry, just a couple minutes. These are some numbers on the rapid transit system. Our current bus system carries 252,000 people a, a weekday. Uh, with rail, that's projected to go to 453,000. With all rail, that's only going to be 314,000. Roughly population increase. Total transit trips. This is the thing. Remember, those are boardings. So that gives you an idea. If you divide that number, I get 252,000, and you divide by 184, it gives you an idea how many bus trips involve a transfer. And I'd like to point out 42% of transit trips will include rail. We can calculate that out. And the last is sources of transit rail. This is the biggest reason why things like elevated carpool lanes and things are not a good idea. Because look, as you can see, the idea that somehow all we really need to solve our transit problem, transportation problem, is a, basically a funnel starting at East Kapolei and running downtown. It's like, look how many people are going to be going to work and school and stuff, boarding the train at places like, you know, especially here and the east side of, in, in our city, right? But well before downtown. Um, airport, Lagoon, a lot of jobs in Lagoon Drive, a lot of jobs in Pearl Harbor. And the last is, this is Pearl Highlands, and basically that is everybody coming from Mililani and, and Waiwa. 9%. So you can see, and then 19% gives you an idea how many people are going to go to Waikiki, going to go to UH, and places like that. So uh, that's all I had to share with you. I appreciate your time, and you had some great questions and discussion, and I'm sure I have more time. Hello, hi. Yeah, okay. I'll go the lady. Thank you. And much thanks to everyone who came out here and took some time off. I know you guys are busy, busy, fancy, important people. Um, <laughs> um, so up next we have Dr. Hector Venezuela. Can we bring him up here, please? Hello, hello, hello. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, and he, I met him at a, what did I meet you? I met you, 
I forgot where I met you. <laughs> where did I meet you? I met. Oh, I met you at a board meeting. Makiki board meeting. Yeah. <laughs> and again at um at a, a GMO thing. So here you go. Hi all. Uh, I would just like to uh, ramble a bit uh, to give you my perspective in terms of uh, what's been going on with the uh, protests around the world and with the Occupy movement, uh, and then end up with a little, some comments about the uh, aglands in the state and uh, uh, the food system. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank and recognize the, uh, the, the Occupy uh, movement, uh, not only here in Hawaii, but also uh, nationally. Uh, I think it was a, actually a, a pretty big thing. I think there was a, in each state, there was an average of, of over 20 occupi occupied cities in each state, uh, and in places like California, it's probably in the hundreds. Uh, even though the, the camps have been taken away in, in many parts of the, in the, of the country, most parts of the country, uh, the Occupy movement continues to live in many ways because it has decentralized and the level of actions continue in many, many ways. Uh, Sukkoti Park is no longer there, but in New York there's daily activities all over the, over, all over the city. Uh, sometimes it's one person, sometimes it's a, te a team of three people uh, to, that have individual actions uh, throughout the city. Uh, in, in Oahu, we have seen the Occupied Movement attend meetings at UH, uh, attend meetings uh, of interviews of uh, administrators at UH, uh, attending Council of hearings with the city council. Uh, uh, they, have, they have occupied Monsanto in Maui. All sorts of activities. Uh, they have participated at meetings with the board, uh, at, at the neighborhood boards, and they have provided pretty articulate views of the reasons of their existence, the, the, the rights of free speech. Uh, so uh, I will really uh, thank and recognize them for, for their work. Also, thank you for the uh, to the Save Oahu Farmers Coalition. Uh, this was a huge coalition of dozens and dozens of people and groups throughout the island that uh, has been organizing for the past few years uh, to try to, to stop development. And uh, I hope the, uh, the, the recent failures that, w that we had with the Land Use Commission, Commission just helps to expose the type of uh, system and corruption that we have in the state and, the, and that it just strengthens the movement of the communities uh, so they can continue to educate themselves uh, to fight for uh, rights in, in, the, in, the, in the state. Uh, sometimes w when we look at the issue, I think we get lost in minutiae minutia, minutia in, in small details. So when we talk about uh, the wars and so on in Iraq and Afghanistan, we talk about uh, details of when should we withdraw, what about the drones, what about torture, and sometimes we forget to ask the big questions, which is, we shouldn't be at war to, to, to start with, and we shouldn't be invading, invading, invading countries to start with. And when we, when we recently, uh, somebody had a, a few years ago, there was a media interview with Fidel Castro, and they asked him, well, after all these years, have you actually rethought your system? Uh, and I thought it was a perfectly valid question, but it's something that we have failed to ask ourselves. Uh, so when we talk about the economy and so on, again, we sometimes we get lost. Sometimes we get lost. Uh, sorry. Sometimes we get lost with the with the minutia, asking the details about this, about that. Uh, but we forget to ask the same questions about ourselves and to ask questions about the economic system. And perhaps we should actually get rid of the entire thing and start something anew. And this is something that we don't ask enough. Uh, raising questions about the, the, the capitalist system, uh, about predatory economics, about the concentration of the, of the market in fewer and fewer hands, and uh, where, where the, the, the public is almost the forgotten. It's not part of the equation. And, and this is the, uh, the, the 99%. Uh, so if we go back to the, uh, to the days of slavery, uh, I'm sure that if you read the newspapers at the time, there was a lot of discussions of the minutia, small details. Uh, should we perhaps improve the labor conditions? Uh, should we allow them to take Sundays off? Uh, should we allow the, the, the slave families to stay together instead of just uh, separating them? Uh, and so I'm sure there was a lot of minutia, but of course the question from, from the start was, slavery is wrong, there should be no slavery. 
uh, we should get rid of that uh, to, to, to start with. And when slavery was actually abolished, uh, it was abolished in, in some aspects, but the, the whole system, the whole social and economic system that allowed it to exist what actually, was actually allowed to, to, to continue. And uh, today we still have remnants of, of the uh, uh, slavery system, and this has consisted of a, a system of persecution and uh, imprisonment of uh, the youth, of the black and Latino youth uh, throughout, the, throughout the country over the past 20 years. And we continue to see the remnants of that system today uh, where the global center of the economy, the global economic center of the world, and the global cultural center of the world, New York City, uh, every year there's 600,000 stop, 600, stop and frisks of young black and Latino and other minorities in the, in, the, in, the state, in, the, in the city of New York. Uh, that means the police say, this, this is a young guy, this is a young male guy, he's, look, he's dressing funny, uh, he has attitude, we're gonna stop him and, 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 freeze, and freeze him just for, for, uh, for no reason at all. And this comes to over 1,600 stops and frisks every day, and this accounts to over 70 stop and frisks every hour in the city of New York, uh, just because you happen to be young and a minority. Uh, so again, uh, sometimes we discuss the details, but we forget. Maybe we should get rid of the entire system. Okay. Uh, today, in the United States, uh, we are continued uh, an economic and military system that was started well over a hundred years ago. Uh, so, uh, which started with the taking over the Indian lands. Uh, taking over lands from uh, from other countries in Cuba, in Mexico, uh, and today we continue with the same pattern with uh, in invasions or interventions in countries like Afghanistan, Gaza, Yemen, Somalia, and in our own hemisphere in Colombia and in Honduras. Uh, so, when I uh, been talking uh, about when I have talked a few times in, in the islands, I've been mentioning, recently I've been mentioning how come all the protests that are going on in the Middle East and all over the world and with, with Occupy, and I mentioned, well, people are, are realized that they have been swindled uh, year after year and uh, they are the forgotten 99%. Uh, and I, I give the, the example of Egypt. Uh, Egypt is a relatively affluent, it has a lot of resources, uh, but over the past decades, people, the people of Egypt have realized all of the money, all of the resources from Egypt have gone for a few percent of the people, and that most of the people have lost with, in terms of healthcare, education, and the same issues that we deal with in the United States. Uh, but if we look at the case of Egypt, we realize that over the past few decades, it has been one of the strongest allies of the United States, and every year, Egypt has been the second recipient of the most foreign aid uh, in the Middle East, second after uh, Israel. And where have all those monies have been going? Have they been going for education or for healthcare? No, they have actually been going to fortify a, a, a basically a dictatorship consisting of the military uh, with, a, with a head person. Uh, and what were those monies being used for? Those monies were actually being used to repress the population, to keep the population from asking questions about how come we don't have education and, and so on. Uh, so this background helps to explain why people are feeling so much anger in the Middle East, in the United States, and increasingly all over the world. Recently, there were free elections, and we realized that according to uh, the powers that be, uh, the people elected the wrong person uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, so the military is once again taking over and saying, well, this doesn't count, so we're going to take, take this over. And we can only assume that the military is doing this with the guidance of the United States, uh, the U.S. military. Uh, we know that the U.S. military can just simply tell them, hey, guys, you got to open the doors, and they would do so. Uh, so the question arises. If in the United States we, the people, chose to elect the right person in our minds, 
uh, would the military allow this to happen or w would they step in just as, as they are advising uh, their puppets to do so in, in, in Egypt? Uh, so w when, I, when I talk a couple of times around the island, I, I bring up how come people feel that they have been shafted in the United States or swindled. Uh, so I, I, give, I give a few examples of, of instances uh, that occur almost on a, on a five-year basis. Uh, the economy, there's an economic crisis, but a, lot of, a, lot of, a few people are making a lot of money out of this, but the taxpayer is the one that has to come in and fix the mess that is left behind. Uh, so I just give a couple of examples uh, for some old-timers like myself. Uh, if you remember the uh, saving and loans crisis of the 1980s, and this resulted as a cause of the deregulation of the financial markets, uh, and this resulted in over 20,000 people losing their life savings, uh, over 2,000 banks going under, and under uh, a loss of 500, of a half a billion dollars, uh, half a billion dollars to the economy. I think half a. 500 billion dollars to the economy. And again, this means that the taxpayer was the one who had to come in and put up all those monies that were lost because of these financial failures. Uh, this is in the 80s. Also in the eight, eight, early, if you remember, uh, the, Chrysler, the Chrysler bailout, uh, the bailout of the airlines. Again, the taxpayer is coming in and in a free market, so-called free market economy, the taxpayer is coming in to fix problems uh, from these big corporations. Later on, we had the dot-com bubble, uh, the, the high-tech bubble. Uh, a few years later, we had the, uh, the energy crisis, uh, Enron, the Enron uh, fail uh, failure of, of Enron, uh, Arthur Anderson, uh, and you remember Arthur Anderson uh, was at one time the accountant of Anderson, and on the other hand, they were the consultants for Anderson. Uh, so they were trying to make uh, m money on the, one si on the one hand, and on the other hand, they were trying to look at their accounting books. And it turned out, everything turned out to be just a, a big fiasco. Uh, Enron turned out to be a big fiasco. They were making special, how did they call them, special entities, uh, special corporations on this side, on that side, just to manipulate the energy markets. Uh, but in the end, everything turned out to be just a, a bubble. Uh, there was nothing in there, and again, this resulted on hundreds and thousands of families losing their pensions, their, their savings, their life savings, and the taxpayer having to come in and bail out all this uh, financial mess. And, and most lately, uh, we had the, uh, the housing crisis, and this, again, was a result of the deregulation of the financial markets. And once again, these were fin finances, big uh, uh, housing units, that were making loans to households, to honest households, knowing perfectly well that these people were not going to be able to, to make those payments. Uh, so again, today we have a, a, a global economic crisis as a result of this housing crisis. Uh, and once again, the corporations, Obama, by the way, was right in his statements that the business is doing fairly well uh, corporate profits continue at a, at a high, high pace uh, since I've been tracking them since the early 90s. It's been double-digit profits year after year. Uh, profits continue awash. Uh, the corporations are awash in cash uh, still today, uh, but the people are in, in dire straits. Uh, so I, I believe that uh, the people uh, are starting to walk, wake and, woken up to educate themselves, and this has uh, resulted in the in, in the in the Occupy movement. Uh, so this uh, just moving on. This moves us on to the uh, to the food system, and the the food system and the agricultural system is somewhat the uh, the, la the last area that hasn't been taken over by the uh, by corporations and by by big business. Uh, and now that the era of oil is coming down, uh, corporations that in, in previous years based their, their, their monies or economies on the, on the oil industry are uh, producing uh, industrial chemicals uh, or pesticides, uh, realize that they have, moved, they have to move on to a new version of the economy 
which is based on the life sciences and on patenting. And in Hawaii, we ended up being in the center of this uh, discussion uh, because we became a, a, a global center uh, for the testing of uh, genetically modified crops. And, and this uh, consists of corporations uh, creating novel organisms, uh, novel plants. They insert new genes, say, in, in the corn plant. Uh, now they can patent those plants. Uh, so from now on, uh, farmers are indebted on an ongoing basis to having to purchase that seed. Uh, the number of varieties that are available to the farmers and to the consumers will be narrowed down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, just like with music, you go to the top 10 songs with food. Uh, if in the old days you like to consume some kind of specialty corn variety or tomato heirloom variety, uh, the future that they are envisioning is to again to the lowest common denominator. Uh, so they would focus on those products that bring the most money and leave behind those specialties that are not producing uh, all the revenues. You have a question? Uh, basically, it's it's a, a, a direct attack on, on biodiversity, and it's totally opposed. It's, it's uh, opposed to the concept of biodiversity. Uh, the system of agriculture that they are promoting is what is called uh, the industrial agriculture or the green revolution, and this consists basically on large-scale monocultures. Uh, currently, there's a, a lot of land, what is called, what are called land grabs in Latin America, Africa, uh, in the United States itself, in the Midwest, and even here in Hawaii. And the method of agriculture that they envision consists of large-scale monocultures. When you have large-scale monoculture, it's entire areas that are covered basically with one or two or three crops. And in biodiversity, uh, we're talking small-scale farms uh, where there's 100, 200 different species. Uh, and in, with small-scale agriculture, we're not talking only about the farm, but also about the green corridors that are surrounding the farm, like a, like a circle, like a, like a ring, and the, and the communities. And each of those surroundings, green corridors, are a source of biodiversity itself. Uh, a lot of times they consist of native plants, uh, native species. Uh, so there's, you create a corridor of native species that, have, that can move from these corridors back to the mountains, from, to the valleys. Uh, but if there's monocultures, you uh, prevent those habitats from existing. Uh, so one aspect of the, uh, uh, the model of uh, patenting and genetically modified crops is the product defense industry. And the product defense industry is uh, a follow-up that was created basically by the uh, chemical and by the tobacco companies. Uh, there was a lot of challenge in the, in the 60, 50s and 60s and 70s saying tobacco is bad for us, uh, acid rain is bad for us, the chemicals are bad for us. So the industries created, created the, the product defense industry, which is uh, the universities may be allied to it, or these may be scientists that are funded, uh, or think, ta think tanks that are funded to create uncertainty in the science, uh, claiming that there's harm from these products. Uh, we see the same with the climate, uh, climate change uh, movement. There's a whole uh, group of think tanks that are creating uncertainty to prevent uh, regula regulators to take action and to protect the public from these, from these products, uh, whether they are pesticides, climate change, uh, products that we're consuming, or lately uh, genetically uh, modified crops. Uh, so today, uh, Hawaii has become a living example of the fight uh, about where, what, where should we actually be, what, what should we actually be doing. Uh, we are rich in resources in the island, in the state. Uh, basically, the main resources are our people. We have some of the best farmers in the world, and we are rich in resources in terms of the land and the ocean. And these resources can allow us to flourish for many years if we handle these resources properly. Uh, so in a democratic society, you would think 
that the, the public would be educated so that we as a community can, be, can make proper decisions about this is what we have done in the past, uh, we can learn from our mistakes, and from now on we are going to use all this land, all this fresh water to develop sustainable communities that can be resilient and withstand the effects of climate change uh, because we know we can do it. You have another question? Uh, because we, we know that we can develop resilient communities to withstand the, the effects of climate change such as droughts, uh, floodings and, and so on. Uh, or are we going to allow these decisions about the future of Hawaii to be made by a few large scale corporations and their local allies in the state, uh, such as the, uh, the, the, the power industry, the, uh, the, the landowners, uh, the, the power brokers in the state, the politicians, uh, the university leaders. Uh, so basically all of these issues that we are addressing on a global basis are coming down to Hawaii and uh, I hope that we can uh, continue to educate ourselves uh, at a community level and throughout the state uh, to tell people what's going on because most people out there, we, if we go to the sidewalks and talk to people, most people don't are not aware of Hopili, they're not aware of Coa Ridge, uh, they're not aware of, uh, of genetically modified crops, about industrial agriculture, and about uh, the food that we're consuming. Uh, we know that our, our diets are the wrong diets, the, the food that we're giving our children are the, is the wrong diet, the wrong food. Uh, we have monoculture in the fields, we have monoculture in our diets, and we have a monoculture in our education. Uh, so uh, it's a time for us to change around and uh, develop a, a, a new future and occupy uh, Honolulu today is the focal point for, for this change. Yeah. <laughs> you have a question? So the, the question is is about Monsanto and to, and to explain what 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 is what are they be, what is behind uh, where's the economy behind what they're trying to do what what is what is the agenda? So Monsanto, uh, Dow Chemicals, Syngenta, all of these are were in these in the, from the 50s. They were large agrochemical corporations. They produced industrial chemicals uh, and pesticides, which, by the way, they borrowed from scientists in Germany during World War II all of the chemicals that they were experimenting with. They, bar they, they took it, brought it to the U.S., and these companies are, arose from those. These large agrochemicals realized that the energy resources were coming down, and the next version of the economy would be based on the life sciences. Uh, so they realized that if they can insert nutrients into plants from one species to another, if they, if they could can insert say a pesticide resistant trait into corn, and if they can patent that plant, that's it. They control the food supply. If they control the seed, you control the future of the economy. Uh, because farmers, basically, food is central to the economy. Food is about uh, two-thirds. The food system is about two-thirds of the economy. We all eat, we all have to consume. McDonald's, all the entertainment, the restaurants are based on, on food. So if these corporations own the seed supply, they basically own the future of food. Uh, so basically they are concentrating at first with the major crops. Uh, today, most of our diet globally is based on 10, 10 crops. So if they can focus on that, those 10 crops, and by the way, now they have six of those 10 crops, they can control a large amount of the food supply. Uh, so they can control not only the seed, but they control the pesticides that they are supplying and they're in increasingly buying other markets so that they control other aspects of the market. They control parts of the organic market, uh, different aspects of, of, of the, the food industry. Uh, so it basically, it's just a, a, a lot of money down the road. Did that answer your question?
Health concerns. So, what are what are the, what are the concerns of, about genetically modified crops? Uh, so, basically, you insert a trait, say, from a bacteria to corn, and this bacteria makes the corn to be resistant to a herbicide. So, you don't only insert that trait, trait, but to make it work in the plant, you have to insert DNA from other organisms to make that trait function properly. So, you insert DNA from viruses, from other bacteria. So you call it a cassette, which a cassette of DNA from different organisms into the plant. So you are creating an organism that has never before existed in nature. So intuitively, you would think, if I'm introducing a new organism into nature, I would ask questions about what could happen from it. And a lot of things can happen from it. It could create new metabolites, new toxins. It's basically called an unintended consequence. Anything can happen. And you would, you would think that if you're going to introduce this into the food chain, that you would conduct safety studies, both to the environment and to health. And you come to realize that early in the 80s, when we were in the, the regulatory uh, focus with, with Reagan and Bush and Quail, uh, we basically deregulated these crops. Uh, so we decided we actually don't need to conduct safety studies because on a political basis, they said a genetically modified crop is equivalent to uh, traditional crop. So if they're equivalent, or substantially equivalent, we don't need to conduct safety studies. Uh, so today we are 15 years later, the public is starting to learn about genetically modified crops, but we have not yet conducted the safety studies that we should have conducted before releasing those products. Uh, we know that we've made those mistakes with pesticides. Uh, we asked, well, are these pesticides actually safe to use? Are these residues uh, safe on our food? And today we are realizing that a lot of those pesticides actually were very harmful to human health. Uh, so the questions that we ask about pesticides, today we are asking about genetically modified crops. Most of, the, most of the world actually has uh, regulatory systems that kind of mimic the United States. However, the U.S. was the first to come into market and they deregulated the market. However, however, other industrialized countries didn't buy that. Uh, so Europe actually put in a lot of more thought into it uh, because they learned about MadCow, where they kind of didn't pay attention to what was going on. So Europe actually looked into it a lot more and they actually decided, no, we're going to label uh, genetically modified crops. Uh, so today, most of the industrialized world, including China, uh, Europe, Japan, Korea, they have labeled. Uh, a lot of other countries from the world, like in Latin, Latin America and Africa, they have kind of looked skeptically at the United States, kind of like a colonial mentality of you guys are telling us what to do, and they have still resisted. Uh, however, if you uh, look at uh, WikiLeaks, at the cables that were released from WikiLeaks, uh, we have seen that the United States is doing as much as it can behind doors to twist the arms of regu regulators in other countries to try to deregulate uh, genetically modified crops. But so far, they haven't been successful. So from, from, from the big picture, uh, talking about minutia, uh, the question is, can we actually have healthy agriculture, healthy lands, and healthy communities within our current economic system? And, and that is a real tough question. 
and, and it perhaps may be very difficult, if not impossible, to have a, a healthy society, healthy agriculture within a current predatory capitalist system uh, where we leave the powers to be to decide for the community how we're going to take care of the land, uh, where we're going to feed our children, and what we're going to educate our children in schools. I understand that in Hawaii, uh, it's, it's mainly the seed producing uh, aspects of the companies that are, that are taking the land. And, uh, they produce the seed in a very sterile environment with, with hundreds and hundreds of chemicals that are very damaging to the environment. Can you speak to that a little bit and the specific dangers to Hawaii? So, so the, uh, the, the, the companies in Hawaii actually make the state a global center for the testing of genetically modified crops. So what they actually do in Hawaii, because they can grow several crops in one year, is do all the experiments to evaluate these varieties. So in the 90s, they actually had pharmaceutical crops. Uh, they had HIV drugs, antidiarrheal drugs that they were testing in Hawaii. Uh, and so they are testing the, 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 the breeding of the varieties, and those that are successful, they will send them to their, to their seed uh, growers in, in Iowa and other parts of the world, and the seed growers are going to expand that seed and then sell it to the farmers. Uh, so Hawaii is more like the experimental site. Uh, but they, nevertheless, they have taken some of the most valuable land uh, for testing these. And the problem is that growing seed involves drenching the fields with pesticides. Because when you're growing seed, that seed has to be totally clean because when you harvest the seed, you don't, you don't want it to be contaminated with weeds or insects or weevils. So that seed, to be clean, has to be sprayed almost on a daily basis. Like six out of ten days, those fields have to be sprayed. Uh, and the question is, only about 1% of the pesticides make it to the target. About 99% of the pesticide goes somewhere else. It goes to the soil, it goes to the air, to the water. Uh, so the question for the communities is, is that pesticide actually eventually going to make it to the aquifers, to the ocean, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to ourselves? And in communities like Waimea in Kauai or in Haleiwa, or in Molokai, all you have to do is drive around town and see all the dust blowing over the towns, over the schools. And isn't that dust contaminated with pesticides? And I know I'm not going to fall dead just from taking the pesticide, but 10 years down the road, am I going to develop a chronic disease? cancer or some other side effects from consuming the, those uh, pesticides. Uh, so the fact that it's novel GM crops plus the chemicals that are raises a lot of questions about is this, is this really what we want in Hawaii? <laughs> I recently, uh, a couple months ago, a neighborhood board meeting, they had, they had in uh, a lady who was speaking on behalf of, she was a seed producer and she had a PhD. Cindy Goldstein. She uh, did a very effective presentation, a very polished presentation, backed up by a UH professor. And she put in a lot of propaganda to support GMO, but she also used the idea of labeling, the subject of labeling, as a way to limit the conversation to labeling. Well, I think that's one of the what he was talking about back there. Oh. Oh, that's a good case. The issue that I wanted to talk about was a lot of times, or I'll just talk about my experience recently at the neighborhood board meeting when the lady came to talk about um, GMO products. She was brought in as a defense because a lot of people had brought up the problems with GMOs before. And she came in, she was a seed producer with a PhD, and she came in and gave a very professional presentation, a very polished presentation um, promoting GMOs and such, but um, the, from the get-go, the, the subject was purposely limited to the subject of the labeling of GMOs, which is another one of those minutiae points. I think it's, it's often a, uh, a diversion from talking about the bigger issues such as cancer and what what GMO foods do when they get into our system and and in the process. Um, if you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. I'm going to end her being here. Um, let's keep the Q&A until after. Can we do that? Is everyone okay with that? Yeah, yeah. Cool, you're going to be. Anyway. <laughs> here you go.
just just to quickly respond to that, I, I agree with you that you don't want to get lost in minutia, but as a community, you gotta educate your neighborhood, you gotta yeah. educate your friends, yeah. but you gotta strategize and say what is our next step, and the next step is labeling. Labeling is like a wedge because if you if those pro, if, if, if these products are labeled, now we can make a choice as consumers. So it would be a step for us to educate our neighbors and say, hey man, you can actually make a choice. Uh, so in this case, it's a good strategic point to say, let's make labeling a central issue uh, because we, this is a democratic society uh, and we have the right to know what we're, we're consuming. Very much, sorry. Mahalo. Oh, okay, yeah. Sure, labeling would be great, but I'm wondering if it's uh, feasible with <laughs> Are you taking questions and answers now? Or? You can do one more. Okay. I'm wondering if it's feasible over here in Hawaii if, if there are any farmers or any organi other organizations going to sue on something because of what you're talking about, the pesticides and, and all the other So, are, are any farmers uh, going to, uh, to planning on suing Monsanto? And I, th I think we have to leave farmers out of the equation because farmers are taking care of the land and doing a lot of hard work. But communities themselves are, 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 are have already in Waimea, Kauai. Uh, right. The community of Kaim right. uh, Waimea has actually uh, sued Pioneer or du DuPont uh, in, in Kauai for uh, over 10 years of, of dust pollution and pesticide pollution. So I think the ball, the ball is starting to roll. Uh, there's question about other communities, uh, but uh, that's up to the individual communities. But I think we can just leave it for the panel. Uh, uh, I have a question. Um, so who are these farmers that are suing Monsanto? Are they farmers that So again, these are large multinational companies. We're dealing basically with six major companies. They have a poor record in terms of the products that they have released in the past. Uh, and you can just educate yourself just by starting to Google at these companies. Uh, simply Google Bhopal, uh, Google um, Agent Orange, uh, Google Aniston, Alabama, and you will learn about the promises that they made back in the 50s to small rural communities about employment, about renewal, economic development, and so on. And today, these are wastelands. Uh, so you can, there's a lot of Facebook, Facebooks, GMO Free Oahu, GMO Free Maui. There's a lot of community educational groups. Uh, there's the Occupy Facebook. Uh, so just join those groups and just keep networking with, with the community. Well, my next question Go ahead, is, name the big who owns the land that these companies are here in Hobart? <laughs> okay, these companies are coming in with a big box. And so I want to know who are, who, who are the landowners that are allowing these companies to come in and monopolize. So who are the landowners? Is it the state? Is it, uh, who, who, who are the large landowners? Uh, don't, don't ask me. They're all the large, the large owners. I think all the power brokers are, are in it. Uh, the transportation people, the large, the land, the landowners, uh, the retail stores. Uh, I know there's a, a movie that has just been released about uh, uh, Kamehameha schools, uh, but in Kauai is Gay, Gay Robinson. But uh, uh, probably all the large landowners are, are involved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The downfall of Agent Orange? Yes. Uh, Agent Orange was called a herbicide uh, that was used to defoliate areas in, uh, in, 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 in Vietnam, but it was actually a chemical weapon. Uh, the government and the, and the corporations knew perfectly well what they were doing, what they were producing, and it was literally a chemical weapon that they knew would de de devastate rural areas, not only at that time, but for many generations. Uh, today, the third and fourth generations of Vietnamese are still affected by Agent Orange, as well as our veterans. 
the government denied that there was any health effects. The corporations denied that there was health effects. And internal documents that have been released have shown that the government and the corporations knew for decades the health effects that these products were causing on our veterans and our, 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 on our, uh, the, the Vietnamese. Uh, by the way, in Vietnam, we did the same thing with cluster bombs. We knew that these cluster bombs were going to uh, implode for many decades into the future, affecting children playing in the gr grounds, affecting peasants and farmers. Uh, so there were long-term uh, bombs that were used, just like we're using uh, depleted uranium today in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and in other countries. Uh, so, sorry for keep going. The, the, these chemicals, sometimes it takes decades, but eventually they may be, they, they may be removed. The problem, the problem with genetically modified crops is that those are living forms and those will be a lot harder. So once a gene escapes into the wild, into the native corn, into the native papaya, uh, it may be imprinted into the genetic information of that plant uh, perpetually. So it may not be possible to get rid of it. Thank you, Hector. Can we give Hector uh, another round? Yeah. Thank you, Hector. Thank you so much for that. Um, Hector, I'm Dr. Hector Venezuela is part of, uh, I think he uh, labeled it Hawaii. Uh, he, also, he does a lot of panel discussion um, events and stuff. He's actually a professor, too, at CTAR at UH. So, yay. Um, ne up next, I have, just an intermission, I have Karina Vegas. She is a family that um, we recently supported and worked with on a project of, of her own. So she's here to um, share her story. So, Karina. Hello. Aloha. Thank Aloha. you again for the, hello, for the opportunity to uh, be here. Um, I love Occupy Honolulu and what <laughs> they're doing to um, support all these causes. Um, to help us, uh, the ordinary person. Um, my story is my family. Um, we own a, a home. It's paid off, and it's on Bishop Estate lease land in Punalu. And for five years, uh, we had struggled with the uh, devastations of the flooding caused by Bishop Estate and also other land management issues. And uh, so after exhausting um, all avenues with Bishop Estate, I was ready to take my story to the people, um, to take my case to the people, because I firmly believe that um, uh, nothing that Bishop Estate is um, um, <clears throat> telling me or taking me to court with being in court, um, trying to, do, um, to settle, um, but all they're interested in is if you don't like it, you leave, or they said that they'll build a house for my family and then we rent to them. And we said, no, my house is paid off and uh, you need to correct the wrongs. So, to cut a long story short, on Monday morning, um, we met with the CEO of Bishop Estate and it was a historical moment because um, I had uh, told them that I'm doing my press conference on Thursday and I was going to do a rally at the state capitol. I will march down Punch Bowl and to Queen Street and Occupy Honolulu will support my family. We were going to occupy their office <laughs> and we also did a film that Occupy Honolulu had helped us put together a documentary and so within not even within an hour, you know, they called, and uh, so within the two days of phone calls, they wanted to meet with us Monday morning. And so at that meeting, they only gave me one hour, and I gave it to them, and I said, I'm walking out this door, and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to stop telling the world my story about ending landlord injustices and saving my home. <clears throat> So, that one hour meeting, they said, uh, okay, we'll call our legal team and uh, we're not going to put an eviction notice on your home and so you can feel at ease that we're not going to evict you from your home. But, 
So uh, I think the moral of the story is that um, he is a huge corporation, the largest landowner in Hawaii, uh, the richest in the country, and one of the richest in the world. And they have all the means to manipulate the law and get the largest legal team in the world, which they told me. And I was going to lose or bankrupt my attorney. And I told him, I don't care if you have all the money in the world. I will tell my story to the world. And it's about ending landlord injustices. So I made a big sign. And I encourage everyone. Um, the sign is, we the people, by the people, for the people, are the people. So speak out Hawaii. So I encourage all of you to speak out. Because if one family can do it, then all the families can do it. So um, I still have my, um, I have a petition that is online right now. Uh, it's uh, two websites, bishopestatelandlordinjustice.com, and one is uh, on change.org. So I invite you to come up and make your voices heard. I have my laptop here. Uh, please come and sign, submit a comment. And every voice counts because it's the petitions here that I had online that they found out and they saw the people's comments and it got to them. And also because they, they couldn't um, manipulate my family or scare my family because right is right and wrong is wrong. And I don't need any money to fight them. All I need is the conviction of the wrong has been done and speak out, and then people like Occupy Honolulu to come forward and, and support. So um, I urge everyone, <coughs> uh, please continue to uh, support the activities that Occupy Honolulu is doing. I think it's an awesome platform. It's an awesome movement, and I think this is where our voices um, are heard loud and clear. Um, I heard the... Dr. Venezuela speak on the GMO, um, and I have a really strong feeling about Bishop Estate being involved in it. And I did tell them, I'm a Kamehameha Schools parent, and as a Kamehameha Schools parent, I will not tolerate any of the injustices that they do. Um, so if they are involved with GMO, um, Occupy Honolulu, I will speak out and I'll make sure that nobody buys those GMO because as a doctor's daughter, my mom is a, also a registered nurse, I grew up on, um, on fresh foods, fresh foods, freshly growing. Um, my dad never ate any frozen foods his whole life and as a doctor he worked for more than 53 years in his profession and not one day sick wow. because of his diet in um, eating fresh foods. So I can speak for it uh, firsthand. <laughs> okay, so no GMOs, but thank you to Midori and thank you to everyone. God bless everyone. Thank you. Aloha. Sorry to cut you off. I know your story is really compelling, but uh, yeah, it can wait. <laughs> um, up next, we have Dr. Keone Dudley. Please give him a round of applause. Um, he was one of the. Uh, please, that can start now. <laughs> that he. Uh, Mic check. Okay. He was one of the petitioners um, uh, against the whole plea development project, um, and I actually that's actually where I met him. So thank you, Keone, for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just talk to you in a short while because uh, the sun is going down. It's going to get dark here pretty soon, and I know there are other people that are uh, anxious to get up here and talk to you. But I do want to talk to you about uh, Ho'opili. And uh, first of all, in case you're not aware of Ho'opili is, Ho'opili is out in the country uh, beyond Waipahu. When you get to Waipahu on the freeway, as soon as you get to Kunia Road, which is the end of Waipahu, you come out into the great big wide open space, and that is Ho'opili on your left-hand side, all the way to Kapolei. Uh, how big is it? It's um, 1,525 acres. 
That's, that's a lot of land. It's about uh, two miles along and about two miles that way, and uh, it's all beautiful, beautiful uh, farmland. That, that farmland, uh, the D.R. Horton has bought. They bought it in 2006, and they would like to buy. Uh, they would they would like to build 12,000 houses on it. Now, do we need those houses? Uh, let's first of all start with that question. The answer is absolutely not. Uh, we've already got 50,000 houses already approved by the Land Use Commission, already fully zoned and fully entitled out in that area, 50,000 houses. Now, uh, the, the city itself says that over the next, until 2035, we're going to need 46,000 houses, 46,800 houses. Well, we've already got 50,000 zones, you know. Do we need this extra 12,000 houses? The answer is just simply no, we don't need those houses at all. Do we need it for jobs? Well, for crying out loud, if we got 50,000 houses already zoned and already ready to build, why aren't we building them? It's because of the economy. It's not for lack of houses, yeah. you know? So, so we don't need the 12 more houses in order to create jobs because we already have the 50,000 houses out there waiting to be built, right? <laughs> so no, we, we, we don't need it for house. We don't need it for jobs. We don't need it for houses, you know? What do we need it for? We need it for D.R. Horton, America's largest home builder, which is not a local company. It is a Texas-based company. We need them to make billions and billions of bucks. And why do we need them to make billions and billions of bucks? Because politicians need to be uh, thanked for uh, the favors that have been done for them. That's why. Now, I don't mean to say the Land Use Commission. I, th I think, personally, the Land Use Commission is a very honest group. I'll tell you, I don't think that anybody, you know, we just had the big decisions, huh? The big decision against Coral Ridge and the big decision against uh, Ho'opili. I don't think for one second that anybody on the Land Use Commission was approached by D.R. Horton. I don't think that they got any money from them. I don't think that they are, uh, I don't think they're dishonest. I think they're really honest folks. It's just they were the wrong folks to get on the Land Use Commission. You know, every one of them has something to do with construction or the unions. And, you know, it, who's going to profit from building things? Construction and the unions. So what are they on there for if the whole purpose of the Land Use Commission is to keep the land in farming? Okay. So we got some basic problems in of our government, and a lot of people have been speaking about government up here. I'm sure it's a <laughs> wonderful afternoon. <laughs> All right, our government is just simply that's the people who are being bought, huh? Yep. And and uh, yep. and you know, Abercrombie met with us before he was elected. We took a large group from Save Oahu Farmlands. I don't know if you've noticed my shirt, Save Oahu <laughs> Farm. I have these for sale up here, by the way. Okay. Really cheap. Um, if uh, we met with Abercrombie before the election, he says, you know, Keone, there's no chance they're ever going to build that uh, the proper property. That's going to be farmland forever. And there's no chance that rail's going to come down there because, you know, I just won't let it happen. Well, it wasn't very many weeks later when he was already elected, and uh, now he was beholden to these folks that he changed his story. So then he starts putting people on the Land Use Commission, like every other governor has, who are going to go for the construction. All right, well, let's get back and talk a little bit about this land. Um, and, and before we get back to the land, let, let me just throw in a little aside here, okay? I just want to pay tribute for one minute, since this is supposed to be a sustainability workshop, uh, pay a, a, a tribute to the father of sustainability, who was on, on this island, and, and in Hawaii, was uh, Ira Roeder. Ira Roeder Years ago, back in 1994, wrote a book called A Green Hawaii, and uh, we, we need to be aware of that because that was the first book on sustainability written. Um, and then he founded the Green Party, and I actually ran for governor in 1994 as a Green Party candidate. Now, the reason we're bringing all that up is the government again. The House of Representatives is uh, run by the Speaker of the House, whose name is Calvin Say. And Calvin Say, as a representative, is running for office again. And there's somebody running against him in the primary, and then there's somebody running against him in the general. The person in the primary, his name is Sinan, he's a nice guy, and I, I, I hope he wins. But if he doesn't, in the general, there's going to be a green running, and that's going to be Keiko Bonk. 
Keiko. From people know Keiko Pock. Okay, she's back. She's back from the Big Island, and she's running for the House of Representatives. Wow. And we need to get behind Keiko, folks. Yep. So I just need to tell you that. Yep. Okay, let me move on and continue on about farms. <laughs> what is there about this farmland? The farm, uh, you know, we, we, we tend to think that farmland that gets a lot of rain is going to grow a lot of crops. And that, that's something that we just kind of grow up with, huh? A lot of rain because you need water to grow crops. What you need to grow crops, though, is not rain and overcast skies, but rather sunshine. Now, the good thing about this property is, where is it? It's down in the lowlands where all the sunshine is. So how many crops can you get there a year? Well, we say it's the highest producing farmland in the world. Why do we say that? Because you can't grow crops year-round in most places. They get one crop uh, per year on the mainland huh? because of their winters. Here we can grow crops all year round, and what our limitations are is the overcast skies. So how many crops can you grow in Hawaii? Well, in Waimanalo, you can get two crops a year because they get a lot of rain in Waimanalo. On the north slopes uh, below Wahiawa and above uh, Haleiwa, you can get three crops a year. But it's whole Pili, you can get four crops a year. Now, wow. it's, it's, it's fantastic land, huh? They have fantastic water and lots and lots of good fresh water. It's also got the right pH levels. Uh, that's the acidity and alkaline in the, in, the, in, the, in the soil. It's perfect for the crops that it grows there. And, uh, and then what other kinds of things does it have? Because it's in a lowland, you don't get the rot, you don't get the mildew. You get a lot less bugs in the, in the lowland, and in and, and, and general, you know, it's, it's the best land around. It was called the Golden Triangle. Now, there's only uh, the one-fourth of the Golden Triangle is left. Everything else is built on. And where is that one-fourth of the Golden Triangle? It's Ho'opili. Okay. So, you know, we're taking the best land that we've got. We, we, it, it, it's all mollusols and vertisols, and I don't know what those things are, except I know that Professor Jonathan Vienick, Jonathan Vienick testified that they are the two best quality soils in the world. Okay? Wow. A thousand acres of that is mollusols and vertisols. It's also a clay, and, and the clay has a problem. The clay expands and contracts when it's wet, right? Okay, and that, if you put a house foundation on top, is going to expand and contract and break the house foundation. So how do you solve a problem like that? Well, D.R. Horton will come in for the thousand acres that we're talking about, and they will scrape off four feet of our best soil in the world, and they will bring in four feet of coral and oh, put it man. there. Why? For the house foundations. Now, folks, what we're doing then is we're allowing them to take the best farmland in the world and to haul it away and, and, and put it in junk places, you know, and, and, and some of it even goes up to the dump. And, and, and instead, they're going to bring in coral, and, and then they're going to put a little layer of, of, uh, of uh, dirt on top of that, and make an Oreo sandwich. Now, Jonathan Deenick says that if we let the world just take care of itself, as long as humankind lives on this earth, that land will not revive. It, it, it won't, that there won't be enough dirt come and intermix with the coral so as to revive itself. Okay? Are we really going to allow that? No! <laughs> well, I like that answer. Okay. Good. And why aren't we going to allow it? Well, because of a couple of reasons. One is, how much food do we have on this island? Not enough. One week, two weeks, two, well, one and a half weeks, less than two weeks of food on the island right now. What happens if the boats stop coming? Military escape. Yeah, we're going to die. We're going to die. Okay. <laughs> how much of our food do we import? If, I mean, if we're so dependent on the boats, how much do we import? We import 90% of our food, okay? Why aren't we going to allow them to take that best land and, and haul it away? It's because we import 90% of our food and we only have two weeks' supply on the island and we need land to grow crops on. 
Now, when they took Ho'opili and Koa Ridge, they took 45% of the land on Oahu that is currently growing crops for food here. I'm not talking about export pineapple and flowers and stuff like that. I'm talking about the, the land on Oahu growing food for local people. They took 45% two weeks ago. We can't allow that to happen. You know, we just can't allow that to happen. Let's, let's take a look at what could happen with that place. And, and, uh, and just think for a minute, okay? If, if, if the farmer there, Aloon Farms, would continue moving out, and they're, they're supposed to be moving out because of the development, huh? That would free up a lot of that land. Now, where, where is the land? It's right across the road from UH West Oahu. What's happening at UH West Oahu? Well, they're, this, they're opening up this fall, huh? And did you know that Ma'o Farms is opening up with them and that they're starting an agriculture program there? And did you know that there are 75 students a year going to be in that program? And did you know that those students who come out are going to need land? And did you know <laughs> that there is no land available? You know, nobody, farmers can't find land. Here is 1,400 acres that is slowly going to be opened up as a loon farms moves out, and we could put those farmers there, and we could double the production there right now. Is that something that's desirable? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I sure think so. Okay, I, I want to get uh, get finished up here and let other people talk. So let me just say to you that. Oh, uh, there's one more thing I do want to talk about. Uh, I, want, I want to talk to you about the, the Land Use Commission and what's happening. Uh, they're, they're going to meet again tomorrow morning. Uh, it's 9 o'clock. It's at the State Office Tower, uh, which is across from St. Andrew's Cathedral. And uh, they're going to decide at that time they're going to confirm their vote from last week. We've got some people coming that I think are going to be pretty impressive. And they're going to try to talk them out of doing that. But most likely they'll go ahead and vote and most likely we'll lose again. On the, in that case, we are going to appeal, and the first step is to make a motion for reconsideration, and then the second step is, uh, if we fail there, to take them to court. Let me tell you that the laws are all on our side. You know, the fact that the, fact that the Land Use Commission voted against us is because it's all the wrong people in the Land Use Commission doing what they're supposed to do, which is protect their own people, their construction people and their uh, unions, you know, but uh, we, uh, we are going to take them to court and we're going to win because the law is really on our side. I think I'll wrap it there. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. I know that you're looking for other people to come up and talk. I'm sure they're anxious to get up here, and so let me just finish but, but up. Can you, can you just quickly yes. say what can people do now to support this effort to make sure that, that everything goes, that, okay, you say it's the laws on our side, but sometimes they change laws, so what can we do in the meantime what to make can sure we they do have now? no other choice but to follow the proper law? Okay, what can you do in the meantime? I think um, you can write the Land Use Commission. Uh, and and uh, you could show up for the hearing tomorrow if you wanted to and testify. I think that uh, the basic thing is, though, write a letter to the editor. Right? You know, that's where it really is going to count because, you know, the newspapers are going to continue. They'll put in anything we send, practically, you know. Uh, and then the other thing is write op-ed articles. I don't know if you noticed this morning, there was a tremendous op-ed article in the paper um, written by Adam Binsley uh, about the Land Use Commission itself. And uh, I, I think that, you know, we need more of those kinds of things. Okay, and uh, then the other thing you can do is look at our website, which is ta-da, Save Oahu Farmlands, okay, dot org. And uh, you'll find all kinds of suggestions there of things that you can do. Yes. I was thinking, um, when I was watching the, because I, I worked in the, I, since I worked in the Land Use Commission, I can't come down to the hearings, but a, um, a lot, I think a lot of people are in that same situation. But I think um, looking at the, the last hearing, there were a lot of the union shirts, the orange shirts there. And it would be orange nice shirts. to see like a lot of green, those green shirts there. And 
um, um, I was wondering if it would be good to like if people wanted to sponsor some shirts there and so that when people show up maybe they might choose to wear it and so that might be a good idea to, to get more green shirts actually more. All right, good. So she's suggesting anybody who wants to make a contribution and sponsor some shirts so we can give them away, that'd be good. Let me tell you that I do have some of these shirts up here right now, though, and I'll be sitting around here, and anybody who is interested in them, uh, they, they, uh, they cost us $9.10 to produce. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not anxious to sell them at a price less than that. So so we're selling them at 10 uh, which makes us a profit of, well, never mind. <laughs> Okay. And um, in actuality, if you don't have 10 and you're really, really going to wear the shirt, we'll give it to you for five. Okay. So oh, wow. right that's pretty good. <laughs> I'm going to have to cut away uh, to make sure. Another one sure for Dr. Keone Dudley. It's safe. Museum in Action at the Land News Commission.